Hey, this is a very exciting edition of the Bible in a Year Instagram Live because today is September 9th, which is, um, I'm actually doing the Bible in a Year for September 8th though, and September 8th is the day when uh, we actually get into the book of Isaiah. So the exciting thing that's happening today is, is we are starting in the book of Isaiah, which is one of my favorite books. And it's funny because a lot of uh, Adventists, they tend to prefer um, Daniel and Revelation, but they totally leave out all of the prophetic stuff that's contained in Isaiah and Jeremiah. So... Um, this is the Instagram Live for Bible in a Year, day 251, which is September 8th, and it's Isaiah 1, 1 through 2, 22, 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 18, Psalm 52, 1 through 9, and Proverbs 22, 26, and 27. Now, this is an incredible uh, book, Isaiah is. Um, So um, I'm not going to take a lot of time on the intro here, but I just want to pray and then we're going to dive into the book of Isaiah because there are so many amazing themes and things to get to that have a very contemporary application. Oh yes, wonderful. If all you can do is listen, listen, because today we're going to be talking about the book of Isaiah, and I've got several of my friends from Ohio on here, um, Doug and Terry, and Megan's joining us from Australia, and we are in the book of Isaiah. Hello, Sherry. Welcome to the Bible in a Year. I'm wondering if it's uh, during church right now, and whether or not Naomi will be able to make it today. Okay. Let's go ahead and pray, and we will dive into our Bible in a Year readings for today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to do the Bible in a Year Instagram live with all of my friends. Um, please just bless this time and help me to think clearly and to be able to articulate and share the things uh, that you are wanting shared um, here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as mentioned... As mentioned, we are in the book of Isaiah now. This is very exciting. And I'm just going to hit the arrow in the bottom right-hand corner and take the time to invite a few people to join us for the live. Every once in a while that helps, especially if I'm on here at a sporadic time. Okay. It's 1.17 p.m. on the East Coast, so WA Australia would be still be in church time. Okay, yeah, they're still in church. Okay. Uh, this is super exciting because today, like I said, we are starting out in the book of Isaiah. And I just want to share a little bit with you about the book of Isaiah. So here is something very interesting that you would not know unless you studied both the author and the time in which the book was written. So, the book of Isaiah states, right, that he is the son of Amos, and so it tells us that he is the author of the book, and Isaiah, the name, literally means the Lord saves. But check this out. Here's something really interesting that you would not know unless you did a little bit of background study on the book of Isaiah, um, Isaiah has a family and he has two sons that we know of that are recorded in scripture, right? Shear Jashub and Maher Shalel Hash Baz. Now, his son's names also are related to the mission of Isaiah, believe it or not, because this is what their names mean. Check this out. The names literally mean a remnant shall return. So his first son's name means a remnant shall return. And the second son's name means speed the spoil, hasten the booty. I know that's hilarious. 
Speed the spoil, hasten the booty. What is it talking about? Well, it's literally saying, um, the faster the plans of man spoil, the, the sooner we can get to the treasure, right? So the themes of salvation, judgment, and remnant run throughout the entire book. Um, there's a couple of other things about this book that I want to point out. Um, this book is actually the very first book um, that really delves into uh, the Great Commission. Okay, a lot of people look at the New Testament for the Great Commission and they act as if this Great Commission of preaching the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations is only contained in the New Testament, but that's not true. Um, we actually find uh, the, the theme of the Great Commission in Isaiah. Check this out. Uh, God expresses his intentions to reach not just Israel, but also the non-Israelite people groups in what can be legitimately called Isaiah's version of the Great Commission in Isaiah 66, verse 19. Okay, the goal of the mission is to bring all people groups to acknowledge God's sovereignty, bow before him and worship him. God solemnly tells the nations, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. Isaiah 45, 22 and 23. So, this book is absolutely amazing because Isaiah is literally uh, the latter half of the prophets. And it's... It's the largest um, prophetic book in the entire uh, New Testament. And um, one of the things that I love about this book is uh, the holiness of God, right, encapsulates his attributes of justice, righteousness, and love. This is the God who is determined to bring about a kingdom of justice, righteousness, and peace. And this is one of the major themes of the book of Isaiah. So... Um, Isaiah uses the term the Holy One of Israel 26 times in this book. And it's because the holiness of God and his character are the things that Isaiah uphold as being the reasons why his kingdom will bring justice, righteousness, and love. That God's kingdom is a kingdom of justice, righteousness, and peace. Now, one of the other things I noticed is, is that God is also described as the one who restores justice to the poor, the needy, the or orphans, and the widows. And this book actually makes an indictment against those who take advantage of the poor. Friends, we live in a world full of people who are more than happy to take advantage of the poor, and all too often, the people doing the taking advantage of the poor are Christians, quote unquote. People who claim to be Christians. Okay, so, one other thing I wanted to point out before we dive into our reading for today, which is Isaiah 1, 1 through 2, 22, is... Um, The, the One of the, the final themes, um, it says, Inseparably connected to the expectation of the fulfillment of God's promises is the theme of waiting on the Lord, which occurs several times in this book. The prophet Isaiah himself is determined to wait on the Lord. The last day vision of reunion of the redeemed with God is celebrated with the following words. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. One of the blessings of this book. Is on those who wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord. Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. A promise is made to those who wait on the Lord that they shall not be ashamed. Friends, if you want to find a book in the Bible that is full of promises for people who put their faith in God rather than in the kingdoms of this world, the book of Isaiah is the book for you. And that is the book that we are starting right now on the Bible in a Year Instagram Live for our Bible in a Year reading challenge. So I hope all of you are just as excited as me that we are starting the book of Isaiah tonight. So hello to all of you who are just joining us. Um, I just went over some of the themes of the book of Isaiah. The name Isaiah literally means the Lord saves. We are starting in the book of Isaiah and... So excited to be doing so because the book of Isaiah is full of promises that God is making just for you. Okay, now Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 starts out, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. Now, this is not just talking about the first chapter, okay? Many people would read this and they would think, oh, Okay, the first chapter of Isaiah is, is Isaiah having a vision. No. Um, this is actually applying to the entire book. The book of Isaiah is a series of dreams, visions, and revelations that God is giving to Isaiah the prophet, which are intended to be shared not only with the people of his time, but with the people in Christ's time, and also the people in our time. That's right. The book of Isaiah is a timeless book filled with visions, dreams, prophecies that the Lord gave Isaiah, which apply not only to his time, not only to Christ's time, but also they apply to our time. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this starts out. When you look at Isaiah chapter 1, it's kind of broken up into several sections. It says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, in verse 2, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Okay, now when it says, Hear, O heavens, why does it say that? Does anybody know? Does anyone know why it starts off with, Hear, O heavens? What kind of language is this? Why would Isaiah say, Hear, O heavens? What would he be indicating by saying, hear, O heavens? Well, I'll tell you. Isaiah starts off in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, by saying, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken, because Isaiah is describing a vision of a heavenly court scene. The court scene, which is taking place right here is one that includes not only the people on earth, the people of Judah who are on trial, but it also brings God into this equation because Isaiah is proclaiming something before both God and man in a heavenly courtroom. Okay, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. So God is speaking through Isaiah and he's saying to the people of earth, listen, enter into my heavenly courtroom. You are my children. I brought you into the world, but you have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So he's telling, he's telling the people of Judah he, he's, he's using Isaiah the prophet to speak to the people of Judah and say, listen, God brought you into this world. You were intended to be his children. You've rebelled against him. And as a result, you don't have knowledge. You don't understand the things of God. And you have become utterly foolish. Then he, he describes the, the, the people as a body. He says, um, why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? He says, here's the reason why you continue to be struck down. Here's the reason why you continue to rebel. Here's the reason why you continue to live in sin and you're doing it. Why? Because the whole head is sick and the whole heart of mankind is faint. 
From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate, your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. Friends, let me just tell you something. What I'm reading right now could literally describe the world today, couldn't it? And this is the amazing thing about the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is a heavenly court scene where God is pronouncing judgment against his people who have rebelled against him, who have turned away from him. And he's telling them as a result of this, your land is overrun. Your entire body is sick. Your mind is not sound. Your heart is faint. From the sole of your foot to your head, there is no soundness in you. There's no soundness in you at all. You don't have any wisdom because you've turned from the Lord your God and you are worshiping the idols and the powers of the kingdoms of this world. In Isaiah 1 verse 9 it says, If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So the judgment coming against the people of God is so bad that they said, listen, if there wouldn't have even been just a few survivors, then we would have been compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how bad it got. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Okay, this is a major insult because he's literally saying to Judah, listen, you people are just like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. And I love this part. He says, listen, stop making sacrifices. I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of the well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Right? Then he says, listen, in verse 13, Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. So listen, these people are incredibly religious people. These people are still coming together and going to synagogue. They're still reading the words of God. They're still offering sacrifices, right? But he says in verse 15, When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. And why is he saying this? Because the people of Judah and the people of Israel are waging war but they're doing it by the power of their armies and by the power of their might. And they have now begun to practice the political practices of the surrounding kingdoms. They no longer put their faith in God. They no longer allow God to fight their battles for them. But instead now they worship God, but they wage war against the surrounding nations in the same way the surrounding nations wage war by their own might, by their own power, by political maneuverings, they no longer trust in God. They are now worshiping idols to try to gain power in order to have their kingdom become more powerful and more majestic than any of the other kingdoms on earth. And they're not wanting to really do it by God, but instead they're wanting God to co-sign their kingdom. In other words, they're not fearing God and trying to live the way God wants them to live, but instead they're living by the, the, the practices, the policies, and the politics of the surrounding nations, but they're still worshiping God and acting as if, oh, God is on our side. Okay? And this is the same thing that Christians do in today's world. We live by the popular politics of man. We boast in the power of our economies. We boast in our knowledge. We boast in our money. We boast in our armies. We boast in the... In, in the, in the um, especially here in the United States of America and in first world countries, we boast in the greatness of our nations and our armies and everything else. Um, Megan says, like Christian na nationalism, we boast in our own power, we boast in our own strength. And so God says, listen, um, your hands have blood on them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Then, I love the last part of Isaiah chapter 1, starting in verse 16. So give me a thumbs up if you're there. And my brother from another mother, Joshua Paul Borum, just joined us. Love you, brother. Happy Sabbath. 
We are in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 16. And we are in a heavenly courtroom where Isaiah is speaking to the people the words of God. And the amazing thing about this heavenly court scene is, is that the words of Isaiah here apply to the people of Judah. They apply to the people in the day of... Um, they apply to the people in the day of Jesus, and they also apply to us now. So, um, let's go to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. And maybe my brother from another mother wants to jump on the live with me. I don't know if he can or not, but I'm going to invite him. Let's see what happens. We might be able to get the Joshua Paul Borum to come on if he um, has had a chance to do the reading for today. He might be able to come on, join me, and throw in a few comments. I'm going to invite him. <laughs> He's all like, dude, you're putting me on the spot. Like, he could just be chilling. There's my bro! How's it going, man? <laughs> hey, are you nearby your Bible, man? Dude, I am. I am. I am. What's, uh, repeat it one more time for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll read Okay, it. we are in Isaiah chapter 1. Oh man, dude, we're in Isaiah, bro. Dude, the problem is, is my phone is is my Bible, and so I have to find an actual Bible. Isn't that just crazy? Like, no. Bible yeah, grab. Like okay, okay. So while you're finding a Bible, listen to this, man. Listen to this. This is amazing. Listen to this. Um, Isaiah is literally um, speaking to the people, and he's saying, "Come into this heavenly courtroom where God is going to hear what I'm saying, and it's the words that I'm saying are literally God's judgment against you." Now, what's amazing about Isaiah? is the book of Isaiah, starting out in chapter 1, begins as a judgment. And when the book starts out, it says the vision of Isaiah. But listen, it's not talking about just chapter 1. It's talking about the whole book. So the entire book of Isaiah is talking about two major crises which happen during his time, but also have a prophetic application to Christ's time and to our present time. And so a lot of Adventists, they literally um, use Daniel and Revelation as the books that are actually going to be um, used to describe the prophetic events of eschatology. But Isaiah is actually the better book to do this with because Isaiah is a complete uh, treatise, not only of what's going on with the people of God in the day of Judah, but also in what it, it, Christ intends to do by bringing salvation through Christ coming into the world, which actually permeates all of time from before the people of Israel to the end of time. Because what, what Isaiah brings out, he begins to bring out is, is, listen, Judah, God brought you into this world. This is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, just to get you caught up on what we're talking about. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken, right? So this is a heavenly court scene. He's speaking to the people of earth. And he's also speaking before God. He's bringing heaven and earth together. There's a heavenly court scene happening. And he says, listen, children have I reared and brought up. So this is the Lord speaking through Isaiah. He's saying, children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. Then part two of the chapter, to catch you up before we go into part three, he literally says, listen, stop praying to me. Stop offering sacrifices to me. And the reason why he is saying this in the book of Isaiah, chapter one, uh, and in verse um, 15, he's saying, listen, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Now, a lot of people wouldn't understand this. But what he's saying is, is you, Judah, have actually begun to practice the politics of the surrounding nations. You have begun to worship the gods of the surrounding nations. And as a result of this, you rely more on your money on your politics and the power of your armies than you actually do God. Yikes. That is. So, so Joshua Paul Borum, let me ask you a question, brother, now that you're on here. Um, would you say that it's possible that what Isaiah is describing here about Judah is true about God's people today? Yeah, absolutely, man. Like this is. See, and this is the beautiful thing about the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah literally is a prophetic book which speaks to the heart of God's people. One, it, it, it brings us into a heavenly courtroom, okay, just like Daniel in Revelation, and so many people miss this. 
We're in a heavenly courtroom where judgment is being pronounced through Isaiah by the Lord on Judah, but these pronouncements of judgment actually apply to the people before the time of Isaiah, in the time of Christ, and even in our world today. Now check this out, because this is where I want to go next. We're going to part three. Here. So Let's hear turn it. there with me in your Bibles, everybody. If you're here on the Bible in your Instagram live, we are on day 251, which is September 8. We are in Isaiah chapter 1, 1 through 222. And right now we're specifically going to go to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 16. And when you get there, give me a thumbs up. And I'm going to have my brother Paul Borum read uh, verse 16, 18, 19, and 20. So let's see a few thumbs up once I see them. Then, Paul Borum, I want you to read these verses because herein lies the hope. Okay? Herein lies the hope. He says, listen, first of all, you've trusted in the popular politics. You're preaching popular politics from pulpit for profit. You're trusting in your armies. You're trusting in your money. You're, 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 you're still coming to church. So the middle half of the book describes the people. They're still going to church. They're still making sacrifices to God. They're still praying to God. But they're, they're, they're claiming their own greatness. And they're, they're, they're claiming to be Christians, but they're really living as pagans and worshiping false idols. So, so what's crazy is this is like uh, Christian nationalism where, oh, you know, like our nation is great and we're going to live by the powers of the kingdoms of this world. And we're going to claim that God loves us more than anyone else because we're wiping everybody else out. So he says, you know what? You, you people are awful. Quit praying to me with your hands because your hands are covered in the blood of the very knowledge and the ways of man. And I don't even want your offerings. I don't even want your prayers. I don't even want your religious services. I don't even want you coming to church on Sabbath and paying your tithe and acting like Christians. Because lukewarm, man, he's ready to spit them out. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you are lukewarm. You are not even living the way I want you to live. You're not representing my character. And so I don't even want to be associated with you. This is painful, bro. And, and you know what? It's crazy that we could literally actually be characterized in that way today. Like, guys, I'm going to say this out loud, and then Paul Borum just, like, cringe if you have to. But listen, the Seventh-day Adventist church is guilty of these things. Mm -hmm. We are guilty of aligning ourselves with political parties and preaching popular politics from pulpit on both sides of the aisle and then slapping the Jesus bumper sticker <laughs> and saying that we're a people of God, but we're not representing the character of God. Amen. And one of the things that I said before you came on the call, just before you read the section, because I see a bunch of thumbs up. Everyone's there. We got Angelina's there. Um, let me see. Um, Eliana's there. Megan's there. Um, anyway, we got a whole bunch of people thumbs up. They're in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. And um, But before we go there, I just want to say this. Isaiah literally calls out the Christian people or the people of God, and he says, listen, the Lord your God is a God who wants you to do justice, to bring his righteousness, and to actually start acting and working on behalf of the poor, the needy, the orphan, the widow, and so on and so forth. And he says, listen, you actually do the practices of the business people of this world who are actually making a profit on the poverty and the suffering of even your very own people and the surrounding nations. So he's making a major indictment of God's people because they're literally doing the very opposite of what people who are following God's character would, would, would do, which is that the nation of Israel was supposed to be blessed by God, was supposed to be given victory over the enemy by God so that they would be able to be a blessing to the entire world. God never intended them to be blessed and to use the ways of man to do war and to do business, to become more and more and more wealthy while building walls around their wealth and leaving everyone on the outside. But listen to the hope now. So he's made the indictment. He said, I don't even want your prayers anymore. But then Isaiah chapter one, verse 16, what does it say? Wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Seek justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come, let us discuss it, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be made white as snow. Though they're as red as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay, now let me point something out about this. The Lord doesn't want to punish you. Hmm. 
The Lord does not want to bring this. Um, he says, if you refuse and rebel, you, shall be, you will be beaten by the sword, right? So it's like, instead of beating your swords into plowshares and having a harvest, you're going to end up being beaten by the same sword that you've decided to use in order to exact your power rather than allowing the Lord to defend you. What does he want to do, though? He says, listen, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat of the good food of the land. Friends, let's claim that promise today on the Bible and ear. If we will actually submit to God, surrender to Christ, and trust him to be our portion, he's not only going to bless us, but he's going to fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit and make us a blessing to others. God desires nothing more than to bless you and me, Joshua, Paul Borum, and all of the people who are listening on the Bible near Instagram live from all over the world right now. Um, he desires nothing more than to A, bless us, and B, make us a blessing to others so that people can know of God's character of love. And, right? I love and when, he, it, and when he describes the repentance, let me just yeah, yeah. highlight this one thing. Yeah. He says, listen, bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. He's literally saying, listen, I want you, the people who are blessed by me, to help the poor. Mm. I want you to plead the cause of the fatherless and the widow. I want you to be using what I've given you to be a blessing to others. Now, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, no, just leading to what you were going to say. You know, like, I just see the, this, this, like, kind of, like, polar opposite of one is, like, hey, we're going to be blessed. We're going to sacrifice to God. We're going to do all these things, and we're going to, like, take, take, take so that we can live and we can lavish the blessings that you've given us on ourselves and then you see this other thing here this whole idea of like of, of really being unselfish with what you have and and then i just i mean i love this like this whole repentance thing that was another thing i really like this verse 16 where it's 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 like it doesn't say wash yourselves you know you know remove it doesn't just say well you just keep on doing what you are doing you know do some sacrifices to get rid of your sin so that you can be okay but he's literally he's like stop doing evil learn to do what is good like that is so cool like god wants us to learn to do good so that we can be that witness and it's not like we he, I, god wants us to just keep falling into sin over and over and over again like he wants us to at, at some point actually have that robe of righteousness on our right and and specifically the verse that you're you're speaking to and i love this okay here's the modern application it's so amazing we always go to Daniel and Revelation for eschatology and for prophecy and everything else. But listen, the Great Commission is first given very loud and clear in the book of Isaiah. The ideas of God's justice, righteousness, and his kingdom are in the book of Isaiah. And the Great Commission to preach the kingdom of the gospel, or the gospel of the kingdom and all the world is witness to all the nations, comes in Isaiah. And listen to this. He says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Here's the first appeal to baptism. And then he says... Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes and cease to do evil. He doesn't say like, oh, you know, repent and I'll clean you and I forgive you and then just go. No, 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 no. Cease to do evil. Mm -hmm. Now we need to jump ahead. We need to jump ahead. And I just I'm not going to we're not going to really go into this next section a lot because it's like really down and it's kind of depressing and sad. Um, and I don't really like to focus on that part as much. But but next Isaiah says, OK. Now, if you refuse, this is verse 20, Isaiah 1, verse 20. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then he says, he goes into speaking about the unfaithful city. How the, how, you know, how the faithful city has become a whore. She who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now is full of murderers. Okay, so he's literally giving them this um, rebuke. You used to be a city which actually had righteousness and justice in it, which means a city that was actually um, blessed by the presence of the Lord and was living like the character of God before others. But now you've become like the surrounding nation, hmm. nations, and you're just a bunch of murderers that are exacting and using your weapons and your warfare and your power in order to be powerful. And so at the end of Isaiah, and I'm just going to... Um, Skip down to verse 31. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 31, because we also have to get through 2, 1 through 22. So we got to move it along here. But um, Isaiah 1, chapter uh, verse 31 says, And the strong shall become tender, and his work a spark. And both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. Mm. So what do you think this is? In your opinion, like when, when you hear me say that, the strong are going to become like tender. 
What is God telling us about our own self-reliance? Dude, we got to get rid of it. We don't have any self-reliance in ourselves. We're just, it's, it's, wow. Right. And then, and then now I want to go to chapter two and, oh man, there's so much good stuff, but I'm going to skip to verse five. So for those of, I know, I know we got to jump over it though, bro, because like we could literally just go on every verse and we would just be, we could be here. We could be here all the way through church tomorrow when I'm supposed to be preaching at Pendleton and Pilot Rock and we would still be here. This is how good it is. But go ahead and read um, Isaiah chapter two, verse five for me. What does he say? This is, this is God's appeal to you and me. And this is where you first see the hint of the appeal for us to become people who are preaching the gospel of the kingdom into all the world. Go ahead and check it out. House of Jacob, come and let us walk in the Lord's light. For you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of divination from the east and of fortune tellers like the Philistines. They are, a, they are in league with foreigners. Their land is full of silver and gold, and there is no limit to their treasures. Their land is full of horses, and there is no limit to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So humanity is brought low, and man is humbled. Do not forgive them. And then he says, do not forgive them. Hmm. Then he says, enter into the rock. Now listen to this. Here's where we start to see the clue of the prophetic language. This is amazing. Check this out. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. That reminds you not only of, okay, so first of all, he's making an indictment against the people of Judah right now. He's also making an indictment of the, against the people in Jesus' time, but he's also speaking prophetically of our time. He's, he, he's prophetically already speaking of the time of the Lord's coming when the people will run and hide themselves in the rocks and cry for the rocks to fall on them, right? And then in verse 11, he says, the haughty looks of man shall be brought low. In other words, people who are proud in their own eyes, people who see themselves as their, I'm going to save myself. Our kingdom's going to be great. We're going to rely on our political leaders, our armies, our money, and all of our wealth in order to, to be secure, and this is one of the things that people are doing in today's world, which scares me half to death is because one, the hearts of men and women have grown cold against others. But two, we've become very self-sufficient and proud in our own eyes. And we believe in our own ability to save ourselves. And even in our religiosity, even when we're in church, we're coming to church to pay our tithe and to go to church and to eat the right way and to, and to dress right and do all of these things to earn our, to, to show others how great we are. Mm. Right. And if you actually I need to back up real quick and just bring out one thing. Listen to what it says, just so that you can see the prophetic es eschatological bent of Isaiah already from the very beginning of the book. Listen to this. Isaiah two, verse two. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted above the hills. Let me ask you a question. Oh, and, and then it says, and all the nations shall flow to it. Let me ask you a question. When the Bible talks about a mountain, where else, what other prophetic book that the Adventist church uses all the time can you think of where a rock turns into a mountain mm -hmm. after crushing a statue's feet? Revelation. Revelation and Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, remember, a rock formed without human hands comes down and hits the feet of the statue which represents all the kingdoms of the world including Europe and all of the kingdoms that come out of Europe right mm -hmm. and it says then that rock once it hits the feet of the statue causes the statue to crumble and then that statue becomes a great mountain and that mountain literally represents the eternal kingdom of God here we go Isaiah actually talks about it way before Daniel and Revelation when he says it shall come to pass in the latter days. Literally, if you look, if you understand this in the Hebrew way of thinking, the latter days are actually God's time. And when they say God's time or the latter days, they're literally talking about in the time of the kingdom of God. Hmm. So, so Isaiah is already beginning to point to the time of the, be, uh, of the kingdom of God. And then he says, listen, now, skipping back to verse 11, stick with me here. Sorry, Isaiah 2, verse 2. Now we're jumping back to 11. You just read through, when you did the reading that you did in Isaiah chapter 2, you read through how they are relying on their silver and gold, their chariots, their treasures, their idols, the works of their hands, right? Mm. And he says, listen, 
The haughty look of man shall be brought low. So the one who is looking at himself for salvation is going to be brought low. And the lofty pride of men shall be humbled. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Uh, let me ask you a question, Paul Borum. What does the Bible describe that's going to happen in the end times? The hut is going to be brought low, man. <laughs> <laughs> See, and, and what I love about this is a lot of people don't get it. This is literally language that you can find in Matthew 24. Like Jesus is literally, first of all, the book of Isaiah not only pronounces judgment against God's people, but it also points to the hope of the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter one, we already read about it, didn't we? Yep. And, and he says, hey, wash yourselves and you're going to be whiter than snow. He's already saying, hey, repent and be baptized and come to the Lord. Come back to the God that you serve. Right. You no, know, I. Then he's saying, "Hey, you guys have put all of your trust in all of your stuff, mm -hmm. but the proud are going to be brought low when when the day of the Lord comes, when the kingdom of God comes. Those who have put their trust in all of these things described are going to run to the rocks of the hill and cry out to be cried. They're going to say, please get me out of here. I don't even want to see God.' And I, dude, pride. I I really think this is, this is like this verse eleven here is is just so powerful because. I think that really pride is, I mean, pride is how this whole world fell in the beginning. I mean, that's literally, if you look to the very beginning of what happened to Satan, when he started getting prideful of himself, he started looking at himself. Mm. And that's literally what like started this whole thing. And it's interesting that like what started this whole thing is also what is going to end it in a way, because like the only way for sin to end is in death itself. And I just, I just, I see this whole human pride thing, man, like, this is something that this is like right to the Adventist church, right to all, honestly, especially Americans and, and all developed countries. Like pride is like really like we, we thrive on that. Honestly, man, like, like I know we don't want to admit it here, but like, dude, how many people aren't prideful of the car they drive or the things they have or the businesses they own or the money that they make or the job they have? I mean, all these things are just, it's literally all pride. And so, man, when, when we like, so when something bad happens in our life, we just need to be like, thank you so much, God, for bringing me down to your level so that I can realize what's most important in life. Because so many times we're like, oh, man, God, what is he doing to me? Why is he cursing me? Why am I losing all these things? No, like he's probably doing he's probably allowing these things to save us so that in the time of the real end, like when, when things are really going down, that that human pride is going to be going to be burnt out of of us and like taken away. Yeah, for every trial, for every heartbreak. For everything that I've had happen in my life, I praise God for it because I'm going to tell you something. There are moments in life where I have like just been humbled to the ground. And in those moments, I realize like I, I, I see my need for Jesus and I find myself like pleading like God save me. And I, I come to that place where I want to be washed and whiter than snow. And I'm like, wow, this trial that the devil brought against me is now being used. God is allowing this thing that's happening to me to actually be used to drive me to the one who will save my soul and give me a new eternal life in heaven. Now, I just want to read, check this out. I'm going to affirm to you what we're saying here. And I want to ask the audience, do all of you that are listening right now, do you sense that we are now in this very moment living in a time in earth's history when we are being humbled? How many, how many of you, I mean, when we, when we see what's going on with COVID-19, we see the wars and rumors of wars, we see, um, we see the, the economy is just spiraling, right, as inflation is just going crazy. Does it seem to you, if, if you think I'm crazy, give me the thumbs down, but does it seem to you that, that we are literally living in a time in Earth's history when uh, the world is being humbled? to its knees, and and I don't even know, hmm. Paul Borum, I don't think it's a bad thing. Listen to this. I'm going to read the last couple of verses, and then we're going to jump to 2 Corinthians, okay? We got to get to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 10, 1 through 18, because you're going to be amazed. The reason we got to get moving to it is because it literally echoes and confirms what we're talking about. Okay. But let me just read Isaiah chapter 2, verse 17 to the end. Check this out. And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low. 
and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. It's talking about the great day of the Lord. Okay, here we go. And the idols shall utterly pass away, mm. mm -hmm. and the people shall enter the caves of the rocks and the holes of the ground. Oh, oh, oh my word. I mean, we're talking about the second coming here, man. We're having a little bit of like Daniel, Revelation, New Testament's all coming. Um, they are going to enter the holes of the ground from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify the earth. And listen to this. In that day, mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, mm. which they made for themselves to worship to the moles and the bats. Here they are throwing away their riches and their money and everything. They Oh, man, get it out. It's not going to help me. It, it, it's failing me. It's not working. They're going to throw all of their silver and their gold to the moles and the bats to enter the caverns of the rock and the clefts of the cliffs from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he arises to terrify the earth. But listen to this. Here is the appeal. And I'm making this appeal to you, Paul Borum. I'm making this appeal to myself. And I'm making this appeal to everyone watching on Bible in a Year right now. Here is Isaiah's appeal. It's amazing. He gives the whole sermon. He says, listen, this is the condition that you're in. You should turn to the Lord. But if you keep doing what you're doing, this is what it's going to be like when the kingdom of God comes. So Isaiah 1 and 2, that's literally the breakdown. He starts off, hey, Judah, this is the way you are. And if you guys don't change and the people of God don't turn to God, guess what? This is what's going to happen. And, and then, then he, he makes the appeal at the end. He, it's very blunt. Stop. It's, this is Isaiah 2.22 for those of you following along. Uh, getting kiddos in bed, Angelina says, hey, it was wonderful to have you here. If you have to fly, we still love you. <laughs> so here we go. Isaiah 2.22. Check this out. Mm. Stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath. For of what account is he? Now, what does that mean? What does that say to you? Stop regarding man. And then he says, in whose nostrils is breath, for of what account is he? What is he literally telling us to quit doing? Stop putting trust in man. For Why? Because there's, it's, in the end, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> it's all going to... It's all he points to the fact that in the nostrils of man is breath because he also wants us to remember that the breath that's in the nostrils of man was put there by God. Mm -hmm. Think about this. We're going back to creation now. Stay with me, bro. Genesis, one, or, uh, Genesis creation of man. <laughs> what did God do? He breathed into the what? Into the nostrils. Into the, yeah. Boom. So he says, listen. If you're alive, remember that, that God, the Bible tells us God is the God of the living, not of the dead, right? Because death was never a part of God's plan when he created mankind. The father of lies and death is the devil. The father of life is God. The breath of life is from God. So he's literally saying, listen, stop regarding man. Stop putting your faith in man because the breath in his nostrils, the life that he's living is not from him. Mm. The life that he's living is from God. And if we, if we don't remember that it's from God, if we turn our back on God, if we live in sin, which literally means separation from God, separation from God means death. Hmm. And, and so what he's saying is, is, listen, instead of putting your trust in man in whose, in, in whose nostrils is the breath of God, remember the one who put the breath there. Or th and this is what I love. Okay, so now I just have to say this. Go, go, go. I'm excited, bro. Uh, Isaiah is my favorite book. You can tell. Dude, I love it. But here's why I'm excited. In two chapters, we have literally, one, heard from a prophet who says, hey, guess what? Here's a vision. The entire book of Isaiah is a vision. Here's a vision. And he starts off judging Judah, but the judgments against Judah are actually applicable to the people in Christ's time and in our time. Then he literally gives a description of the fact that God doesn't want their worship anymore because they're living like the world. Then he says, repent. And then he says, if you don't repent, then he goes, oh, by the way, in God's time and in his kingdom, here's what happens to everyone who doesn't repent. So what he literally does is, is he starts off by calling out Judah. But in the end, he's literally saying, guess what? For all of the people who ever read this vision, by the way, all of you who don't repent, the same thing's going to happen to you. You will be judged by God who is just and righteous. And the breath that God put in your nostrils will be removed from you. Hmm. Dang, this is getting crazy. Dude. And, 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 and so now suddenly, 
And, and then also in that first two chapters, we also hear the gospel commission. He says, hey, listen, if you wanted to be like Jesus, you would be helping the poor. You would be loving others. You'd be taking the blessings of God and you'd be letting yourselves become a blessing to people all over the world. Friends, the book of Isaiah literally points us to a God who breathed life into our nostrils. And then, and, and then he is, why is he rebuking us? Why is he allowing us to go through times of trouble? Why is he allowing us to suffer the trials that the enemy Satan is bringing on us? God's not doing it. Satan's doing it. But why is God allowing it? He's saying, I'm allowing it so that hopefully you will come to me you will repent so that I can bless you and I can make you a blessing to people all over the world. You know, you know, Steve, how many of you are encouraged I love, just by the first two chapters of Isaiah? Dude, this is, this is beautiful. I love, I love verse 18, this whole, like the idols will vanish completely. It doesn't say, Oh, they'll, they'll keep a couple. Like that's crazy, man. And like, when you think about like idols and you translate that into like our time right now, man, like, honestly, I think we, if we really started looking at this objectively, we'd start realizing that we've got a lot of idols in our closet that we don't want to admit that we have. And, man, like, how much better would it be to get rid of those idols to do something good and start trusting in God now so that we don't have to get to the point in in verse, in chapter 2, verse, you know, verse 18, where people are literally, I mean, like, what, what, like, idols, man, like, we need to be, we need to be, following god and making god our idol not idols you know like that just that's just so we need to be worshiping god right and and we're literally we're made in his image and paul Borum, i'm gonna say this just before i came on the live i created a post check it out when you jump off of here i i put each slide on my story but i said listen this is one of the things that helps us to stay sober friends think about this in your heart and in your mind when your life comes to an end when that breath that's in your nostrils is gone and you're sleeping Will you wish that you would have spent more time possessing stuff? Hmm. Hmm. Idols. Or will you wish that you would have spent your life loving the people that God placed his love in you to love? Hmm. I mean, friends, when we get to heaven, you're not going to get to heaven. I mean, like when it says store up your treasure in heaven, do you imagine, P Paul Borum, that you and I should be calling to try to find a, a way that we can get one of those discount storage sets so that we can put like all of our favorite stuff in heaven so that when we get to heaven... Like we'll have all of our furniture and our nice things for our mansion. Or when he says store up your treasure in heaven, is he speaking of people? Hmm. Yeah. People, man, it's people. It's all about people. And I think that so many times, like at least, you know, where we live in America, I feel like all we see around us is the marketing for the idols of this world. And I, and like, I like having nice stuff myself. And that's, that's been really hard for me sometimes because I, it's nice to have nice things. And many times you don't even think it's an idol and then it really becomes an idol because you live your life dreaming about whatever that is and thinking about it. And you're not even like focusing on people anymore. It's all about yourself. And then the devil gets yep. in all on yourself. And then in the end, the idols are going to completely vanish. That's, that's what I love is it does. It's not like, and in the end, all your accomplishments will be remembered. It doesn't say that. And all of your money will be remembered. And you're going to take it with you in a briefcase. It doesn't say that. It's like all the idols, they just vanish. They're just gone. That's the, what the only thing that's remembered is the people who were loved by God and chose to love others. The law of God, the thing that like literally is the foundation of his kingdom. As we build people, as we lead people to Christ and we see them become living stone built on Christ, the cornerstone, that's the only eternal thing, right? I was just calling my friend Melody today and I said, you know, Melody, I said, I need to spend more time intentionally making friendships with people. Hmm. I just need to make friendships with people I need to spend time with people. I need to have dinners with people. Like the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, what is it good for you to do, oh man? It's good for you to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. And then he says also, guess what? How do you live your life while you're alive in this world to honor God? Take the blessings that God has given you and share them with other people. Like literally create time for friendship. Create time for, re let Jesus live in you. And then through letting Jesus live in you and through you to love others the way that he, he loved, let that form friendships and relationships with people that will lead them to the one who can give them eternal life. Okay, we got we to gotta jump forward. I gotta, I, we can talk about that forever. I know it's wonderful. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. So I need a thumbs up from everyone in the chat. When you get there, we're going to 2 Corinthians. Did I say cat? 
okay. Uh, no, okay. All right. Love it. We're live. The cat. We have a kitty cat joining us for Bible in a Year. Love it. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Okay. Now, uh, we have a lot of people on tonight that have never been on the Bible in a Year Instagram Live. And so let me just give you the quick rundown. First of all, uh, the live is literally um, our Bible in a Year Instagram Live is following a Bible reading plan, which is a part of the Bible in a Year reading challenge. Now, it is never too late to start the Bible in a Year reading challenge. In fact, you could literally go to my Instagram, click my link tree link in my bio, and we lost Paul Borum. I hope everybody else is still here. Um, so, um, you can click the link tree link and you can download the eight and a half by 11 or the 11 by 17 Bible in a year reading plan. My suggestion is if you download the Bible in a year reading plan and you want to start reading the Bible every day, because what we're doing is we're praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and we're spending time in the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm and Proverbs. So we're praying, we're reading the Bible daily, right? And if you were going to start this now, just start on September 9, because the Bible in a year reading plan is literally set up so that, um, like a calendar, I'll just show you one more time. So you see the month of September, and then you have 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and you can literally check the boxes when you've done the readings. Okay, and right now I'm actually doing the Instagram Live for September 8th because I'm one day behind, but that's okay. So if you want to be a part of the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge, it's never too late to get started. What we're doing is we're reading through the entire Bible in one year, if you haven't started it already, start on September 9. Download the Bible in a Year reading plan. Start on September 9 and read all the way until September 8 of next year. You know, or start on the 10th or whatever. But it's never too late to start. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. If you spend time every day in God's word, if you spend time praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you spend time in God's word, you claim the promises, you're going to end up beholding Jesus. You're going to see the character of God. You're going to be changed from glory to glory to be more like him. And as a result of it, you're going to end up leading other people to Jesus, and you're going to be ready when Jesus comes again. I mean, it's just plain and simple. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete that work in you before the day of the Lord when he comes to take us home. Okay. Uh, hopefully, Paul Borum is able to come back on. I'm going to see if he gets actually is able to get back on here so I can invite him to finish the time with me. But right now, give me a thumbs up. If you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm just going to read a few of the verses here, because I don't want this live to go for too long. I'm glad that all of you are here. It's Friday night. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Thank you for joining me for the Bible in a Year Instagram Live. Uh, here we go. If you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, just give me a thumbs up so that I know you're there. Megan's there, and I'll probably see some more thumbs up uh, momentarily. Here we go. I just want to read... 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our war warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ being ready to punish every disobedience when your disobedience is complete. Listen, what I just read sounds very complex, but it's literally echoing everything we just talked about in Isaiah. Check this out. We don't walk in the flesh. So in other words, we shouldn't be relying on ourselves. We don't wage war according to the flesh. In other words, we shouldn't be waging war in the way that the world wages war. Uh, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy the strongholds of the devil. I'm going to invite you back, brother. Paul Borum is coming back. So we destroy arguments and every prideful opinion raised against the knowledge of God. This is amazing. Check this out. Literally what I just read, I'm going to read these verses again. Second Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse three. Listen to this, Paul Borum. You're going to be blown away. Sure. Listen to how this is literally outlining and echoing everything we just read in Isaiah. Check this out. We do not walk in the flesh. We are not waging war according to the flesh. In other words, we're not waging war according to the pride of man or by the methods of man. 
Then it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So when we turn our lives to God, then guess what? We become those blessed by God, by the bread, by the word, by the Holy Spirit, by the favor and the blessings of God. We are blessed to help the fatherless, the widow, the poor, the needy, the people on the highways and the byways, and all of the people who are enslaved to sin. So he's saying, listen, the weapons of our warfare are, are, are spiritual weapons that destroy the powers and the principalities of darkness in the unseen heavenly realms. Okay, then let's just go ahead and continue on. I'm going to read a few more verses. He says, we destroy all of the arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. I'm just going to stop there. Think about this. We live in a world full of people right now who, rather than trusting in the word of God, believe in their own opinions and in the knowledge of man and in the science of man than in what the word of God says. And so he says, when we let the Holy Spirit in, when we, when we quit relying on the flesh and we start living by the Spirit, then we get used by God to destroy every single lofty opinion, every prideful opinion. Are you hearing the themes? Dude, every fire. prideful opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. We lead every person to what? Repentance. This is the very thing Isaiah was talking about. Being ready to punish, and now here comes the judgment in the heavenly court scene. Being ready in verse 6, being ready to punish every disobedience when your, when your, when your um, obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. Okay, what is he saying? He's literally saying we should quit looking at other people as the enemy. And we should start realizing that the war that we're fighting is not against flesh and blood, but instead the war we are fighting is against the powers and principalities of darkness brought into this world by Satan and his fallen angels, which are trying to take captive and destroy every human life, every child of God that's ever come into this world. And Isaiah began in Isaiah chapter one by reminding us, hey, Judah, you are the children of God that God brought into this world. He bore you into this world, and now you have rebelled against the God that gave birth to you. You're literally the children of God. Friends, Paul Borum, we need to start seeing all of the people all around the world as the children of God. Mm. We need to literally see every person that we ever interact with as children of God. And if they're living in sin, then what we realize is, is this person is living in separation from God because of Satan. And we want to be used by God, like Paul says to bring down the strongholds of the darkness and the powers and principalities in the unseen heavenly realms so that we can see people set free. So that they literally, because in that moment, they become the treasure that's being built on Christ the cornerstone. You know what I love too, Stephen? I just, I just had this really cool, cool thought. When, when, and, and maybe you were thinking the same thing. I don't know. But this whole verse here um, where it says, we demolish arguments and every high-minded thing raised up against the knowledge of God. You know what I was thinking? Like the best way to make a good argument, the best way God can make a good argument through us that he is good and when, is when we let Christ live through us and love flows out. That's the best argument that anyone will ever have that Jesus is good and that God is good and that a relationship with him is amazing is when we let it live through us. That is the argument. I, I was just reading that. Like that is the argument that demolishes all arguments is when Christ is living in us and people see, they think, you know, God is not good. And then they see God living through us and they're like, okay, well, that's the argument. That's the argument is our life. When we come to the Lord and we're washed clean and white as snow and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, suddenly the love of God is poured out through us and we become a blessing to everyone. And our te the, the testimony that Jesus is alive, mm. Jesus is living in and through us. So the fact that Jesus is alive and that he's the savior of the universe becomes true in the fact, and get this, John 14, 12. You end up doing the works that Jesus did in greater works than these, he said. Mm. So, the, so the thing is, is that even the miracles of God, number one, the preaching of the gospel happens. So we preach the gospel of the kingdom, but he says, as you're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the works that I did in greater works than these are going to happen. So the miracles of God's love for the hungry for the widow, for the fatherless, for the sick, for the poor, for the enslaved, mm -hmm. all start happening in and through God's people. And the love of God is the evidence of his character that wins everyone over from Satan. Because, Paul Borm, you don't have to convince people against death. Mm -hmm. You don't have to convince people against poverty. 
You don't have to convince people against sickness. Mm -hmm. You don't have to argue that they don't want that. Yep. <laughs> And when, when they see that we serve a God who loves them enough that even in their sin, he dies for them, forgives them, mm -hmm. sets them free, washes them white as snow, recreates them brand new. Mm. They pass from perishable to imperishable. I mean, like, okay, Paul Borum, here's the thing. What you just said is contained in the very last part of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Jump there, please, and read it. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 13. Just start reading that. Okay. And while you're reading, I would love to get a roll call. Can everybody just tell me where you're from that's on the Bible and your Instagram live right now? Jump in yeah. the chat. Verse 13. Here. Tell me where you're from. So just type where you're from in the chat because I would love to see where everybody is from and who all is here and wish everybody a happy Sabbath. So while Paul Borum is reading 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 13 through 18, just go ahead and type in the chat. Let me know where you're all joining this from, okay? Okay, verse 13. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but according to the measure <clears throat> of the area of ministry that God has assigned to us, <clears throat> which reaches even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we had not reached for you, since we have come to you with the gospel of Christ. We are not bragging beyond measure <clears throat> about other people's labors, but we have the hope that as your faith increases, our area of ministry will be greatly enlarged, so that, so that we may proclaim the good news to the regions beyond you not boasting about what has already been done in someone else's area of ministry, so that the one who boasts must boast in the Lord, not in himself. Man, I love that. For it is not the one commending himself who is approved, but the Lord's commands. Ooh, I like that. that yeah, it's the one who the Lord commends. Commend. So, so check this out. We've come full circle. We've literally come back to the place where he says, listen, we're not going to boast beyond limits but we'll boast only with regard to the area of the influence God has assigned to us individually. So friends, here's what I want to say to each and every single one of you. And I'm going to go ahead and do a little roll call here. So we got Mario from Melbourne, Australia, uh, Jamie from Pendleton, Natasha from London, Eliana from Wenatchee, um, Gretchen Hinkle from Pilot Rock, Oregon, Megan from Australia, uh, Northern New South Wales, and there's others that are still coming in. But listen to this. You're not going to believe this, Paul Borum. You're not going to believe You're going to believe it. He says, we're only going to boast about in regard to the area of influence that God has assigned to each of us individually to reach even to you. We got someone from Spain on here. Who do we have from Spain? This is cool. I don't know if we've ever had Spain. Elizabeth. Oh, hello, Elizabeth. Welcome. Happy that you're here. That's very exciting. So, Paul Borum. This is what I want to say to everyone on Bible in a year. And then we're going to go to Psalm and then we're going to go to Proverbs. So we're coming to the end of the live. Next, we're going to be, just so you guys know what's coming next, we're going to be in Psalm 52, 1 through 9. So if you will, turn to Psalm 52, 1 through 9. And when you look at Psalm 52, 1 through 9, I want you to tell me the one verse that's your favorite in Psalm 52, 1 through 9. But here's the comment that I want to make. Friends, each and every single person listening to the sound of my voice on this live right now, that will later watch it on YouTube or that will later see it on Facebook. Okay. Everyone who hears this video, that's listening to my voice right now, this is what God wants to say to you. God has a good work for you to do that. He wants to do through you. Mm -hmm. God wants to do a good work in and through you Amen. to reach people for his kingdom. <clears throat> and you have literally been created and designed and placed in this world for such a time as this so that God can use you to reach people that only you can reach. Mm. That's literally what that's saying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it one more time. Listen to this. We're not going to boast beyond our limits. Why? We will only boast in regard to the area of influence God has assigned to each of us to reach even to you. Hmm. Bro, I mean, that's awesome. dude, I'm just going to tell you, Paul Borum, the word of God is all that you need to get super excited. Dude, it is. It is. So exciting, man. I, I love it. Like we are it's the, mind blowing the vessels, man. We're the vessels. If we're not, there's no other way to get it, to get it across. <laughs> the fact that God is using us, we're clay vessels. Mm. I love it how it says it in Psalms, you know, he's like, we're just the earth and clay vessels, you know. Just the fact that God's love and his power shines through clay vessels, through dirt, <laughs> and that he lets us be a part of of literally 
his love and his character mm -hmm. and his salvation and his glory and his words and his love and his songs and his prayer and his praise and his devotion to his and everything and his Holy Spirit and the light of God, everything, blessings, like the fact that he lets us be his hands and feet, that God himself would come down and die and he would breathe the breath of life into our nostrils so that we could live, so that our hearts could beat, so that our minds could work, so that our hands and feet could literally be the love of God to others is mind blowing. Mm. That's crazy. It's just mind blowing. Okay, we're in Psalm. I know we have to move on. Paul Borm's like, yeah, Stephen, dude. No, I this love live it. is going to go no, no, all. No, we're going to be here. We're going to praise the Lord all night, dude. If if we spend more time with God, is that going to be a problem? It's not going to be a problem. <laughs> Just kidding. I know we got to. But I don't want to like persecute the saints. Yeah, it's, we gotta I, I don't want to persecute the saints by preaching for too long. Dude, it's good. Okay. Psalm 52. Oh, I just got to read it. Do you want to read it? Dude, I'll read what you want. What, what version are you reading? I am reading the who knows what version. The study Bible. Uh, Christian standard Bible, I think. Yeah. The first one. I could okay. Let me just read verse one. I'm going to read verse one. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to, you and I are going to tag team this thing. I'm going to read verse one. You're going to read verse two. Then I'll read verse three. We're going to just go back and forth. Here we Boom. go. Ready? Do it. Rapid fire. Psalm 52, one through nine. Listen to my version of, of verse one. Why do you boast of evil? O mighty man, the steadfast love of God endures all the day. Mm, like a sharpened razor, your tongue devises destruction, working treachery. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. <laughs> You're, you love any words that destroy your treacherous tongue. This is why God will bring you down forever. He will take you. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. Mm. Sorry. Uh, the righteous will look with awe and will ridicule him. Saying, see the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. <laughs> Do you see how this all goes together today? Verse seven. Oh, man. man. Keep like, going. Verse seven right there. But I am Yikes. like a flourishing olive tree in the house of God. I trust in God's faithful love forever and ever. Oh, man. I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I will trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. And then verse nine. Love this. And this was the one that Megan said was her favorite. Um, I will thank you forever. Because you, Lord, have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. The name of the Lord is good in the presence of those who are godly. Don't forget that. Man, that is because we cannot actually proclaim that the Lord is Messiah and King and Savior unless the Holy Spirit is in us. Okay, so the name of God is good in front of those who are godly. In other words, the name of the Lord is good. Those who proclaim the name of the Lord are those who have passed from death into eternal life. Absolutely amazing. Okay, Paul Borum. We only have one thing left to do, and I'm sad. <laughs> because I could just want, I could just stay, and we could just read the Bible all night, and I would just be all about it. Dude, why are we stopping? I don't know. We could go, we can, we can start doing the reading for Isaiah. Not, no, <laughs> you know, people have to get sleep and go to church, Paul Warren. Okay, fine. I have to behave. Dude, I have to we could just tomorrow. preach all night. I have to preach I tomorrow. To preach I actually tomorrow have to go too, to church. Man. Sometimes I, got, I forget I'm a pastor. I got second I've got to preach it. I've got to preach at Pendleton at nine 30 in the morning, pilot rock at 11. And then I think I have another thing tomorrow afternoon. So Dude, killing it, bro. Yeah. I, I mean, it. this man, I must, I must, um, you know, get some rest. I think that God approves of, um, but yeah. Megan says, let's do a Bible in a year all nighter. I'm like, oh, yikes, I'm wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Like, I'm going to be preaching in church tomorrow. Like, I read the Bible all night, but now I can't even think of one word to, to say to you for the sermon because my, my brain is <laughs> okay. in need of uh, sleep. Okay, Proverbs 22, 24, and 20. Oh, wait, no. Uh, Proverbs 22, 26, and 27. Okay, uh, I'm going to do, you go ahead and do verse 26, and I'll do verse 27. Proverbs 22, yeah, verse 26. 22, He's verse getting 26. There. Okay, so I'll read 26 then. Before you read, though, let's do something special tonight. Let's do something special tonight. Tonight, I would like, we're actually in a, 
Paul Borum, you're my prayer partner for the 40 days of prayer. So the Paul Borum has been praying for me every day. I've been praying for the Paul Borum every day. I actually have several others that I'm praying for every day during the 40 days of prayer. And I have several friends who are praying for me. And I'm so excited about that. Praise God. Amen. And if you don't know what the 40 days of prayer is, then just go to my link tree link in my Instagram bio. The very top link on my link tree, it says vertical 40 days of prayer in the book of Acts. It's never too late to get started. Tomorrow is day 10. Join us for the final 30 days. We're trying to grow this thing. And the only thing we're doing is we're reading a little portion of Acts every day. We're praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we're asking God to give us his vision for our lives as individuals, for our local churches, and for the entire Upper Columbia Conference. And here's the dream, Paul Borum. The dream is, is that, you know the song that says, It only takes a spark. To get a fire going, then soon all those around will warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love, once you experience it. And then it says, what is it? Oh, I'm forgetting the last words. One, two, two, uh, or something. I don't know. Yeah, you have to pass it on. Yeah. The life of love, you have to pass it on. I, I can't remember exactly how it ends. But anyway, the idea of vertical in the 40 days of prayer is that we want to see God's vision poured out to us as individuals, mm. to our local churches, to the Upper Columbia Conference, so that the, the, the revival that starts here is going to go into all the world as a witness to all the nations so that Jesus can come and again. I'll tell you what, dude, this, whole, this whole pray, praying, praying for others, man. It's oh. like so powerful. Like I, I'm just, I'm, I just gotta say something just really quick, really, really quick. Like literally, my wife. Go, go I, for it. Go for it. Go we, for it. Tom. We, we, we like had this, had this prayer list, and and I, we would just pray every day for these different people, right? And we were just, we were like, man, you know, you, like you never know what's gonna happen. But like different people were about to get divorced. There was just all this stuff. We were like, you know, we're just gonna pray for it every day and just give it to God. And we did just like every day. I'd just go down my list. I'd do my prayer list, and then. um some things kind of got rough with, with, with my life and my business and some stuff happened and I kind of fell off the radar a little bit and kind of stopped praying for that. And I was like, man, later, like a couple months later, I was like, you know, I need to get back. I need to do my prayer list again. I go back. It was actually like around probably like six months later. I started looking at all the previous prayer requests and we were literally looking down the list and literally it nearly brought me to tears because literally almost everyone was answered. I mean, there was, you know, some here and there, but God had like worked miracles, even with the prayer that I had prayed. And so all I've got to say, man, is just praying for others, man. Just like praying for others is just such a powerful thing and it changes your life as well. But also it really helps those around us who we're praying for, I think, in a real way. Okay, so here's what we want to do. I love what you just said. I totally agree with it. Here's what we want to do. What we want to do is I'm going to ask everyone to put um, put any prayer request you'd like in the chat and then the Paul Borum and I are going to say a prayer at the end I think we should just have a time of prayer right here on the Bible in a year Amen. Um, one we're going to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in every person's life we're going to do that for sure we're going to pray that God's going to give you his vision for your life so that you can be a part of his kingdom coming and his will be done but if you have any other prayer request oh and um we have it in the chat here. So um, you spread his love to everyone. You've got to pass it on. So it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around will warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you experience it, you spread his love to everyone. You have to pass it on. So, yeah, I love that song. Thank you for putting the lyrics there in the chat. So, uh, Paul Borum, while you and I are reading the Proverbs... Uh, Proverbs uh, 22, um, what is it? I'm sorry, right. 22, 26, and 27, we're giving people time to type out prayer requests in the chat. I like that. Give me to read. 20. Because I think we, we absolutely, we must close with prayer. We must be praying for each other that, um, hey, you know what? Let's just proclaim this. I'm going to claim this promise right now. Tonight on the Bible and Your Instagram Live on September 9th, God is pouring out his Holy Spirit in the hearts and minds of every person listening in a special way. Tonight is the beginning of a new chapter of our lives in which God is going to use us to reach men and women, 
boys and girls for Jesus every day of our lives until we see him coming in the clouds. Mm -hmm. How many of us want to claim that promise? Amen. Okay, so uh, Proverbs 22, 26, and 27. Let's check it out. Let me do 26, and you do 27. Okay, go for it. Okay. Don't be one of those who enter arguments and who put up security for loans. Okay, don't be one who enters arguments or sets up security for loans. So what is that talking about? My, my version says, this might help. Let me, let me read my version. Um, be not one of those who gives pledges. So if you've pledged something, why are you pledging, Paul Borum? <laughs> like, if, if you're having to pledge something, it means that you're taking out what? A loan. It's like you're swiping a credit card. Yep. <laughs> so, 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 for instance, you're saying, listen, you give me all of these goods, and I pledge to you this thing in the future. So this is like the olden day credit card, right? Mm. So it's saying, hey, don't be one of those who gives pledges, who puts up security for debts. Hmm. In other words, I'm pledging that I'll do all of this in the future if you give me all of this now, right? And we don't want to be people who are getting things now and having to pay later. Hmm. Yikes. That can end, uh -oh. end bad. <laughs> the Paul Borm's phone is overheating again. Oh, is it? Maybe. Is it? It might work. I think it's still working. Okay, good. You're, you'll still hear, but I just saw that you were, we're going to have to pray. <laughs> um, okay, we got some prayer requests coming in. I'm going to read verse 27 now. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should your bed be taken from under you? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, listen, don't try, listen, if you've got a bed to sleep in, quit trying to get stuff you don't need because you're going to end up taking out all of these debts and these loans, and then you're going to end up having your very own bed taken right out from underneath you. You're going to end up in the streets. Yikes. Okay, we got some prayer requests coming in. My heart is touched. Pray for Pastor Farr. May God always be with him. Mario, you are a true brother. I love you, man. And Mario, are you not from Melbourne, Australia? Are you the one that's from Melbourne? Remind me, bro. Okay, Natasha says, I would like to pray to not worry about being single with no children at my age. Yeah, that, hey, that can stress people out, can't it? The enemy tries to use that to distract and distress me. Thanks, guys. Uh, Jamie says, I got a prayer request. I need guidance and direction for my husband's career choice. Leah Loves Life says, I have a prayer request. God, use me to win souls where I'm at and for the church I'm at right now to grow. Megan says, I believe in God and his promises, but struggling with finding a sense of purpose in my current season. So we're praying for purpose. Um, from, from Spain, praying for coworkers. Mario says, yes, I do live in Melbourne. So do we have any other prayer requests? It's not too late to, to pray. And I just want to give a shout out to everyone that's here tonight. Paul Borum, it's it's Friday night. The Sabbath is here. I am so excited. We have Eliana, Lynn, Naomi, Leah, Renee, Natasha, Megan, Mario, Jamie, Sharon, Karen, or uh, Mahela, and Terry, Gretchen, Mario, Peggy, Sherry, Elizabeth, and the Paul Borum and Pastor Stephen Farr right here. Or just your brother. Just call me Stephen. Hmm. But um, wow, man. Like, this is exciting. We're all here. We're all together. Um, Renee's saying, I want to pray for more deep friendships in my life. That's something I was praying for today. I was saying, God, bring people into my life that I can have friendships with, that I can spend time with, that I can invest in, that I can pour my life into. Um, when our life is over, we're just going to want to say, hey, we lived every breath that God gave us, every moment that God gave us, we lived our lives letting God use us to love others, to develop friendships, relationships, to mentor people, be mentored by people. Yeah, that's the kind of life we want to live. Mm. Okay, Paul Borum, do you want to go ahead and kick off our prayer? Yeah, yeah, do you want me to, uh, yeah, definitely, man. Do you want to pray after me then? Yeah, you go ahead and pray, and then I'll say a prayer after, and I'm going to try to get in some of these requests that I read, okay? Okay. 
Dear God, I just thank you so much for Sabbath. I thank you for today. I thank you for this Bible in a year, dear God, that we're able to just get in your word, dear God, and let you speak through it to us, dear God. And I just thank you for the lessons today that we've that we've come across, dear God. Just just the whole, you know, giving giving up our We're having some technical difficulties. But God still hears the prayer, even if, if it's breaking up. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pray because we've lost Paul Borum. He's timing out on us. Um, Lord, you see all of the prayer requests here in the chat. Um, thank you, Mario, for praying for me. I really appreciate you, brother. Uh, we're praying for Natasha, um, for her not to worry about being single with no children. Um, the enemy definitely tries to use that to distract and distress us. Uh, we're also praying for Jamie, that her husband will have guidance and direction for his career. We're praying for Leah, that God will use her where she is to win souls for the kingdom. We're praying for Megan to believe God's promises and to find a sense of purpose and um, direction in her current situation from spain we have a prayer that god will send co-workers um natasha is also praying for all of the requests um and um mihaela was offering a suggestion for um a possible career path and i just want to finish this prayer lord by praying that each and every single person listening to the sound of my voice will feel the outpouring of your Holy Spirit and the baptism of your Holy Spirit in their life tonight. Jesus, pour out your love in our hearts and in our minds. We want to turn away from the things of this world and from the pride of life and from putting our trust in the things of this world. And we want to put our eyes upon you. We want to be filled with your love and we want to be your hands and feet. Lord, we want to do the works that you did and even greater works than these. And we want to have the courage and the boldness to preach the gospel of the kingdom without compromise. Lord, help us to boldly preach the word of God without fear, to share it in love, and to allow, allow our lives to be a sermon of your love to others as you use us to reach others for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, wow, this has been a wonderful time, and some of my friends are just now joining us. Melody's here, hello Melody. And we had a few others just now jump on. We are just now, sadly, we're just now finishing the Bible in the Year Instagram Live, and this has been the Bible in the Year Instagram Live for, um, oh, the Paul Borum's back. Hold on, I'm gonna invite him back. Just before we go. I got to have the Paul Borum on here. Earlier, hey, Melody's here now. Yeah, sorry, guys. My, my phone is... No, it's okay. We heard we heard most of your prayer, but then you it overheated. You timed out. I don't know, man. Uh, listen, Paul Borum, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us on the Bible in a Year. This has been the Bible in a Year Instagram Live, um, day 251 of 365. Um, thank you, all of you, for joining us. Happy Sabbath. Was there any last things you wanted to say to everybody, Paul Borum? Dude, I, I mean, I think maybe you heard my prayer or not, but I, but you, luckily you, you said it in your prayer, but I just, man, like, like the personal application for me and my prayer is that we just, we stop putting our treasure in the things of this earth, man. We, we start, we start looking up a little bit more, you know, maybe more than we have before. And we really, really start putting our putting our trust in God and put in just spending more time in God's word like this whole Bible in a year that's why I love this Bible in a year like it is it has really helped me to just get in the word and God's word does not return unto you void like you might think oh man there's some boring parts of the Bible but I gotta tell you like I have not had one dull day in this in Bible in a year yet like it is it is so good so God is good man and I'm more excited okay guys God. it's never as you heard from Paul Borum, and you got people, I want to make, I want to point this out. Uh, Mario is saying thank you to the Paul Borum. Um, Melody saying, Josh, I'm so happy that you joined. 
Uh, Leah's saying you're a blessing. Bro, I always love having you on Bible in a Year. You are a huge blessing. I feel like when I have you to talk with, you and I, like, get excited uh, Naomi said, uh, Paul Borum and Stephen Farr are the dream team. <laughs> so I just feel like when you're here, bro, like your heart for God gets me excited and we talk back and forth and I just feel like Bible and E are so much better with you. So thank you for coming. Guys, it's never too late to be a part to start the Bible and E reading challenge. Go to my link tree link in my Instagram bio. You can download the Bible and E reading plan in either the eight and a half by 11 or the 11 by 17. And as I've said many times, don't try to start from January 1 and catch up with us. Just start from September 10. You know, download, print it out, read a little bit of the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm and Proverb. Join us in praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your lives every single day. Let's read the Word of God. And by the way, Paul Borum, let's not just be hearers of the Word, but let's be what? Doers, man. We got to be doers. We want to be doers of the Word. Yeah, we want to be hearers of the Word. We want to be doers of the Word. We want to be living testimonies of the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. He's on the throne. His kingdom is coming, and his will is going to be done on earth. We, have to, we, we, we need to be living arguments of God's love to the world who doesn't believe there's a God. Living arguments of God's love into a world that doesn't believe in God. Um, okay, so I'm just going to read the comments real quick, and then we're going to go. Naomi says, dream team. Megan says, yes, amen, happy Sabbath to all. Mahala says, dream team. Natasha says, happy Sabbath. Um, let me see. Oh, I lost some of the comments. Okay. Eliana says, thanks, guys. This was fire. Praise God. Happy Sabbath. Um, happy Sabbath, everyone. Paul Borum, I love you like a brother. Dude, thanks, man. Thanks for uh, – improv i love i love jumping on man anytime i can anytime god asks me hey like you know share what you have sh share the faith that's within you man i'm i, I never want to ever be found saying no so this is good thank you all right man well hey god bless all of you this has been the bible in your instagram live for day 251 we'll see you tomorrow i'm going to be doing the live for day 252 and 253 that's right we're going to be doing a double header all in one live maybe i can get a hold of the paul borm and get him to join us we we'll see or you can yeah god bless the college place man <laughs> we'll see you. oh i'll just come down and see you and then we'll just do the live together at the airbnb sounds good let's do it see you guys all right love you man yep you too man bye everybody happy sabbath <laughs>